Internet Project at Freedom House. I'm going to act informally as the moderator of this session. However, as an open forum, this is really supposed to be a conversation, a conversation among different stakeholders, including government officials, uh, the private sector, civil society, and others about uh, Freedom Online Coalition. As many of you know, the Freedom Online Coalition is a group of 21 uh, countries uh, from all regions of the world that have come together and have committed to coordinating with each other and with other stakeholders uh, to advance internet freedom. During this open forum, uh, Freedom Online Coalition members will give updates on the work that they have done so far, and uh, we're also going to uh, get feedback from everyone in the audience uh, in terms of what do you think should be the priorities, and what kind of ways and what kind of mechanisms should be in place to really enhance the coalition's uh, work in uh, advancing internet freedom. We're going to jumpstart this discussion uh, by having several members uh, of government uh, who are uh, members of Freedom Online Coalition talk about their work so far, including uh, about uh, the work and the upcoming uh, conference in Estonia. So without further ado, I would like to give the mic uh, to Director of Estonia, uh, who's going to uh, talk a little bit more about what's coming up. Hello to everybody, I'm very glad to be here with you today. My name is Vila Turm and I'm from Estonia Policy District. Um, we are the coordinator of Freedom Online Coalition uh, this year. So that's why uh, also the, the coming conference is the great place in Estonia. But I will just give you a um, short update about Freedom Online Coalition where we stand in at the moment. Um, so the, the coalition was created in uh, 2011 in December in Hague by the uh, Dutch Foreign Minister Rosenthal. Uh, at the moment, there are 21 countries belonging to the coalition, and they are always very glad to enlarge. Um, there are certain certain criteria that the country can become a member. It's not as difficult, so we we want to be cross-regional. Um, up to now, there have been three conferences taking place. The conference in Tallinn is the three fourth. There was first the one in Adoration Conference uh, in Hague, uh, 2011 December. Then there was the uh, conference in Nairobi. The third one in Tunis. My, my colleague from Tunis will tell you a few words about the uh, last two Tunis conference. And now the fourth one will take place in, uh, in Tallinn um, on 28th and 29th of April. So all of you, you are most welcome to come to Tallinn. Um, about our, our target, the goal, so uh, Freedom Online Coalition is uh, standing for the human rights um, in the internet. So we, we want that, um, um, that the human rights uh, would equally apply offline and online. This slide just very generally says we are um, we are not only doing conferences, we are also um, working like uh, every day, every week um, on, on different uh, issues and in, in different parts of the world. Like last, uh, last um, task that we did was a um, joint statement in OSCE Human uh, Dimension Implementation Meeting in Warsaw. Which was, which was made uh, on behalf of the Freedom Online Coalition. So this is, um, there have been some other joint statements earlier. Uh, there have been panels uh, organized by Freedom Online Coalition. So about, about Tallinn Conference, uh, very briefly, um, the, the target is to engage the civil society and private sector uh, even more than uh, up to now. There will be um, a document drafted, which will be drafted by the civil society together with the private sector, and then we take it over from the government side. We, we will agree on the document, and uh, and then idealistically it will be adopted by the ministers. So all of you who want to contribute, please send me an email to to have your contact, and, and you can be part. Also, the document uh, as a draft version will be uploaded on the, on the website of the conference so that everybody can see it from there and can send the comments and, and corrections and 
and, uh, and everything, so that it would be really like very open, very transparent, very interactive process. I think I will hand over to David, to, who has been uh, there since inauguration of the Freedom Online Coalition, and who, who certainly knows much more than me about uh, about everything. So I, I hand over to David. Thank you very much for being so many here. Thank you, Pirat. And uh, Devil will be able to tell us a little bit more about uh, really what Freedom Online Coalition is and what mechanisms so far have existed to involve other stakeholders. Uh, the government of the Netherlands has really taken the lead uh, role in the coalition. So being able to hear really what has been uh, done so far, as well as uh, some of these things from your perspective, will be extremely valuable. Okay, thank you uh, very much. Uh, uh, my name is David van der Weert and um, well, I think uh, 2013, uh, uh, the, co uh, the coalition uh, is almost on the way for uh, two years now. We started out uh, two years ago really with the idea that it's necessary to get countries together that are uh, uh, thinking on the same line uh, uh, in the field of uh, uh, freedom, uh, freedom online and also the respect for human rights uh, online. So. The idea behind that is that we thought there was a greater need for diplomatic coordination amongst ourselves, um, not only uh, uh, during our own conferences, but especially actually in all these international meetings taking place. Uh, we thought it would be a good idea to have a group together uh, and be able to uh, really uh, uh, align, uh, align ourselves. But also, uh, we felt there was a need to liaise in a, in a more direct way with civil society and uh, with the private sector. So uh, during uh, uh, different conferences, but also uh, at meetings like these, um, uh, we've um, always organized uh, uh, discussions with civil society. And actually currently, and this is also one of the reasons why we would like your input very much, we're really looking at a way to uh, get that more structured. How do we get a more structured input from, uh, uh, from, from all of you? and um, uh, also what in, in the future should be uh, the specific um, areas the coalition is going to focus on. And what we've been um, uh, trying to do in the, the past two years is also enlarge the coalition since uh, uh, its founding. And I'm not sure, I mean, would people like to know the member countries? Is that is it clear for everyone? Or I can maybe just um, uh, quickly uh, say that you know, members are Austria, Canada, Costa Rica, the Czech Republic, Estonia, Finland, France, Georgia, Germany, Ghana, Ireland, Kenya, Latvia, the Republic of the Maldives, Mexico, Mongolia, uh, the Netherlands, Tunisia, UK, and US, and Sweden. In, I was going to say in an alphabetical order, but I don't know if Sweden then does it yet. Anyway, but um, um, uh, um, so, you know, we've, we've also been working on enlarging this coalition and engaging other countries. In, see if, uh, if they want to be become part um, uh, of, uh, of this group of countries. And currently we're also uh, looking at uh, creating three work strands. And this is actually what we've been doing also at the Tunis conference. Um, uh, we, set, uh, we set out three themes that we think uh, are themes that um, the coalition should do more work on in the future. Uh, an internet both free and secure, uh, looking at um, uh, the digital development, issues and um, issues of transparency and privacy as a, as a third strand. So I think maybe that's enough uh, for now. I'm not sure, did I forget something? No. Uh, excellent. And now we're going to hear from from, Moez, from Tunisia. And as many of you know, Tunisia hosted the last uh, Freedom Online Coalition meeting. Thank you very much. I'm um, very glad to be here. Shared with us from Tunisia, and it was really a great opportunity. Why? For different reasons. First, I will highlight that the Tunisian conference was like a very good time for the regional period, and we know very well that we don't have a constitution, it's got a lot of flows in the region, in Tunisia, and a number of human rights and so on. Uh, so, uh, what is new in Tunisia? What, what, what we did for the Tunisian meeting was really a work in the because we involved for the first time, the society inside the country for with matters related to human rights and privacy and freedom. We know that we have been through a lot of censorship before. 
indeed there was an enemy of the internet, was considered a different organization. And having this meeting in the country and not outside of the country, at which different activists participated before the different meetings, was very important. So involve the activists that combat freedom of that combat censorship during the regime was very really essential for us. You cannot have a meeting with government and without seeing the activists. It was really contributed to the situation that we have today. So it was a real success in this matter because we have uh, more than 120 people, normal, young generation, and activists participating actively in the, in the, in the conference. But it is not like that, just that, because the steering committee that was in charge of the organization team, and the logistics, and somebody made to the invitations, and so on, was managed by civil society. I was the chair of this group, and civil society was involved in all the booking things, all the responsibility he made, it was me. And it's not the government, uh, people, who did that. So the conference was like the civil society, the governmental conference, that organized by civil society, by the Tunisian people. Uh, third thing that I really uh, for the Tunisian conference is just the outcome. So I think for the first time we had a statement in the society addressed by the government. And this is, this is much very important because we are government, we are committed to the multi stakeholderism in, in this kind of conference. It's not just a coalition of, of governments that are dealing with these issues as we deal in human rights again so we are there to be close to the society, to be close to the activists, to be close to the people who are really active in this field. And uh, the last thing I want to highlight also is about uh, being able to, to organize this conference in Tunisia is somehow to confirm the commitment of it. Tunisia is the first country in the MENA to be member of this Tunisia was the first and the only country in the wicked to advocate for human rights. It was really a tricky thing, I understand that, because we know very well how the wicked and how the ITR was addressed at the conference. But Tunisia because did a lot with the coalition members to address the human rights issue in the free and And this is a symbol, it's a message that we address to the, to the region, and also it is a message we address to our people, because the government commit to the freedom through this coalition. Not have safeguards, legal safeguards, not have a constitution, but at least we have this commitment to those standards. That we want to work with with the society to maintain the freedom of expression and right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that's a very important point that Mo has made and that is how countries that uh, become members of the Freedom Online Coalition can actually uh, use their membership to reaffirm uh, their practices towards free and open internet. Uh, I would be curious to hear from uh, different panelists, uh, what role do you think Freedom Online Coalition can play in that extent? So for example, if, you, if we have a government that joins, are there any mechanisms through which Freedom Online Coalition can actually uh, help them uh, adhere even further to, uh, to free to human rights online. Well, the interesting thing I think about the coalition is that we're, I mean, it's really um, an informal coalition. Uh, so we don't have many mechanisms and structures, I have to be honest. But I think on the other hand, uh, uh, the fact that as a government, uh, you decide that you want to become a member uh, already makes it uh, something where you look inside your own uh, uh, organization uh, and your own institution and say, are we ready to do this? And, uh, are we so so I, I do think that there is a, a way and I think on the other hand, this is maybe also something that we could further develop. Well, we could maybe look at are there that specific things that we would like to uh, uh, Developed within the coalition, but here also I would like to hear maybe the opinion of uh, you know of, of organization present here. If, you know, do you think that should be something that we should take up? Well, that's definitely an interesting point for conversation. So, in addition to uh, government, uh, or in addition to uh, individuals who have helped prepare Freedom Online Coalition meetings in the past, uh, we also have representatives from various stakeholder groups 
who can very briefly talk about the ways how their stakeholder groups, whether that be businesses, civil society, or uh, international organizations, uh, can participate in Freedom Online Coalition in a constructive way. And in addition to that, uh, any recommendations that they have uh, to strengthen these processes and to really make a contribution uh, is something that we would like to tease out during this meeting. So I'm going to ask Chris Riley of Mozilla to start and offer his perspective on the private sector. Thanks. For, for those of you in the room, you know this is uh, unusual for me to be wearing the private sector. But um, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I think the first thing I want to say, uh, the, the key here is engagement. Having this workshop is terrific. Having the annual Freedom Online conference is are terrific. I'm already lobbying to make sure I get to come to Estonia. I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, I uh, would encourage uh, more forms of online engagement, um, web resources, other forms of communication. I know a lot of these have been discussed and will continue to be, um, but more intermediate opportunities in between these events for us to talk to you, to hear from you uh, about the various substantive issues that are on the table, I think would be very rewarding. I would love to help with that, the document that the Estonian representative mentioned. Um, and I really love the model of that and would encourage that model to be used more, this idea that early drafts will be posted online. There will be community feedback going into those and suggestions. This is something I've been thinking about a lot uh, for Mozilla, a, a sort of a notion of open source policy or open source policy making like open source software development, right? Mozilla gets its strength from open source software development with the community of thousands of people who do not work for Mozilla contributing to the end product. And doing that at the policy making level is sort of, I think, what this document is aspiring to. And I think it's a really, really great role to have. Um, so what I'd really like to see is the output of that, I think, uh, is a real concrete engagement with some of the key issues at a, as far from being abstract layer as possible. So I think the best fits engagement is a really good role model for that. The best fits uh, output for the last two IGFs has, has been substantive policy analysis and recommendations at a, a very sort of concrete level. And to the extent that that is possible, and I know this isn't aspirational, but to the extent that it's possible for the governance and the Freedom Online Coalition to try to achieve something that hits that level, I think that would be amazing. Um, and there are lots of different uh, substantive issues that that could touch on, uh, and I don't want to be prescriptive. I mean, the obvious two that come to mind first for me are data localization and, and how that is evolving around the world, and also, of course, surveillance. Um, and I know that these are aspirational, these are complicated issues, but a document that represents agreement among the world's leading internet freedom supporting governments and civil society and the private sector would be an incredibly powerful contribution to the normative development around these issues. Thank you. And considering that best fits were mentioned, uh, then I think this is a good segment uh, to hear from Andrew. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I'm Andrew Puddyfack from Global Partners Digital in London, but also one of the um, organizations that's part of the best fits, which is a, essentially a network of organizations. It's a platform. It's not an organization. It's just a form in which civil society groups from around the world try and collaborate around internet governance and internet policy issues and we're into our second year and, and building up momentum um, as we go along and I, I guess from and I, there are a number of people from the Best Bits Network here as well who I'm sure have their own comments to make and, and thoughts to add to, to the conversation I, I think from a civil society point of view this, it's a very crowded world internet field there are a lot of different conferences and events, um, it's a very complex world. So it's very good in our mind to try and think what is the distinctive proposition that the coalition offers that warrants our kind of engagement and how should we engage with that coalition? Um, so that's a big question. And in my own mind, I answer it in the following way. I would say that the coalition is the only intergovernmental institutional framework whose core purpose is the promotion and sustaining of human rights and democracy in the internet world. And that seems to me a very valuable part because all of the other institutional frameworks have a different purpose. And human rights is something we try and insert into them, but it's not part of the core DNA of what that cooperation mechanism is about. So that's firstly for me the big value. And I think at the government level there's a real value for that 
in intergovernmental, co uh, intergovernmental coordination. But one of the things, anyone who works with government, I guess anyone who's been in government knows, governments themselves are coalitions. You know, they're not, there's not a single voice in government. Governments themselves represent the accretion of interests. And quite often, you can have a government whose minister, whose foreign minister might say one thing and whose interior minister may be doing something else. You might have three different policy positions on the same issue. And as I saw when I was at a meeting in Delhi last week, um, where I saw a minister talk about the importance of a multi-stakeholder approach to policy making, his own permanent secretary talking about balancing multilateral and multi-stakeholder, and his national security advisor saying it's the multilateral approach you want to go down. So three completely different perspectives from the same government on the same platform in the same meeting within half an hour of each other. So I think the co one of the things the coalition can do is help educate itself and its own members about what the human rights perspective is on any particular issue coming up in any forum. So that, and we know we saw that at the Wicked that countries in the coalition often didn't necessarily think through what the human rights positions was in relation to the Wicked in Dubai. So from our point of view, using the coalition as a mechanism to engage governments on what the core human rights positions are in these areas is, is, I think, is, I think, very, very important. And I think the thing that Chris added, which clearly Mozilla could be a fantastic ally in that process, is that wider public engagement with a very informed user community and developing the idea of, of open source policy making. And I really love that idea. I think it's, that would be a collaboration, I think, in civil society we'd really love to, to engage with because I think Mozilla's in the forefront of engaging a broader user community. In terms of what the going to then what would be my sort of civil sort of society ask of the coalition, I think probably three things come to mind. The first, which maybe follows on from what Chris's idea is, is building a broader engagement with the wider human rights and democracy community in internet policy issues. Um, one of the things that I always notice is the 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 human rights profile in internet governance and policy discussions has definitely risen since the Tunis WUSIS conference. But it's still pretty thin and it can still be marginalised. And I think bringing the broader human rights movement into the internet policy discussion and debate and using the kind of strengths of the coalition to do that could be a very important part of broadening our constituency and broadening support for those core values uh, in this environment. The second is, in a crowded field, you know, thinking about, I mean, Fadi Jihadi in a completely separate context has talked about orphan issues. There are a lot of human rights issues that don't surface in the, in the internet world, and that should be there much more prominently. I mean, I'm certainly struck continually. We had a great session in Tunis on gender, uh, on women's rights online. And all the women who came out of the meeting said this should be much more a mainstream part of internet discussion. And, you know, you look around this conference and it isn't. You know, we've managed to get to a Miss Internet uh, uh, forum, uh, which is clearly uh, not exactly the direction many of us envisage women's rights online would go. So I think there may be issues like that, but the, the coalition, could I say, these are issues which aren't really surfacing elsewhere. They're key human rights issues. Can we find a way of bringing them back into the mainstream? And the third is the, the one of the attractions of the that the national conferences or the, the, the conferences that have been held is the very powerful regional focus. And I mean, Mo has mentioned this. What really, I facilitated a discussion on, on religion and free speech in the Middle East and a completely fascinating discussion with activists from Tunisia and Egypt recounting the kind of experiences they had at dealing with that very fraught relationship. And it was really great to have so many people from the region present so using the coalition rolling program to focus very much on regional issues and what I'm really hoping with Estonia is, I mean, we, we, we rarely, rarely see our Russian colleagues uh, in civil society at these meetings. We rarely see our Polish, Ukrainian, Georgian, East European and, and East of the Elbe. It's a very, the internet governance forum has always been fairly thin. So I think the meeting in Estonia could be a great opportunity to engage in people from their, the region and bring in uh, some pretty tough challenges actually that are happening there and focusing on what we can do as business, as society and as governments to support our colleagues in that region. So three things occurred to me, I'm sure there's, there's lots more, but I think the, the one takeaway I have is there is no other forum 
that exclusively focus on promoting human rights as part of its DNA. And that's the thing that I think we really need to value in the coalition and really need to think about how we can build its support. Thank you very much. Uh, that is very constructive feedback uh, to actually jumpstart this discussion. So let me turn the mic to the guy from UNESCO and then we can hear uh, from the perspective of international organizations. Thank you, Tanya, and thank you, everybody. So uh, I'm Director for Freedom of Expression at UNESCO, and uh, freedom of expression is one thing, of course, that uh, one of the human rights that UNESCO upholds, but it also is mandated in the UN to look at other rights, like culture, education. So uh, it's really interesting uh, to deal with the Freedom Online Coalition because their interpretation of freedom is freedom in terms of rights. And, and uh, we are developing a concept called Internet Universality, adver advertisement for a session tomorrow morning, uh, which actually says uh, more explicitly, I think, that what is a free internet? Uh, this morning, uh, and, and our interpretation is it must mean freedom to respect human rights, or for human rights to be respected. This morning somebody tweeted that uh, freedom on the internet is freedom of expression. Well, is it, is, of course freedom of expression is, is a very critical right, maybe it's mission critical, but um, what about other rights such as the big debate about right to security, right to privacy and so on and so forth. So I think that uh, one thing that this forum does is begin to give content to what is freedom mean, free internet, and, and to enable debate about how do the different rights stack up against each other and how do you apply international standards if one right is in the face of another right. Um, so th that's of interest to us at UNESCO. The second thing that is of interest to us is that the Freedom Online Coalition has a program called Digital Defender, which is trying to support uh, people whose uh, safety and security is under threat uh, internationally. And with UNESCO, we, we also really try and support uh, the safety of people who, particularly those who use the freedom of expression for journalism and online for day problems. So I think that's an interesting initiative that's come out of this forum. Uh, I, I would say that, uh, uh, it, in fact, in relation to that, the Freedom Online Coalition has partnered with UNESCO is at the World Press Freedom Day in Costa Rica last year uh, to run a panel called Safety Online, Security for Journalists in the Digital Age. And so there was very high level of representation that panel, including the, the Swedish Minister for International Development Cooperation, the US Assistant Secretary of State for Public Affairs, Frank LaRue, the UN Special Rapporteur, uh, and, and others. So it was, it was, we were able to get very high level voices to speak on this question of uh, security for journalists in the digital age. And uh, I'd use that as a model for the coalition to go forward because it's great for the coalition to have an annual conference, but to be engaged at additional fora I think is very important for us. So I think the, freedom, uh, the World Press Freedom Day was one of the first that the Freedom Online Coalition actually took its its brand and its ideas to other forums. But of course, in uh, the, the WISIS process, for example, uh, the Freedom on, Online Coalition could have a role to play. I do know at UNESCO, some of the member states in the coalition have had meetings, but I think it's more the exception than the kind of uh, ongoing community. Which brings me to the last thing, uh, which uh, to echo what Andrew was saying. Uh, you know, the net and human rights issues are very, very complicated, and many, many diplomats don't know the, the beginning of where to start with them. And I think that if the Freedom Online Coalition can have uh, a role, it's really to raise the digital literacy of people in government and particularly government representatives in, in international forums such as diplomats. So I would hope that, uh, well, I hope again Freedom Online Coalition will partner with us well for this Freedom Day, which probably will be here next year. <laughs> and uh, I hope also that at the conference coming up in Tallinn, it will be able to debate what does freedom mean in terms of the balance of rights and also bring a lot of diplomats there so they can really begin to have their literacy of uh, awareness raised. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So we have heard from different stakeholders as well as from governments and uh, already several issues have come up. Uh, in one hand, uh, we've heard about some of the emerging uh, issues that could be put on the agenda, whether that be uh, data localization, whether that be surveillance, uh, the issues of attacks, and so forth. Uh, and the other part is actually some of the mechanisms through which civil society and other stakeholders can get involved in Freedom Online Coalition. Uh, so now that we have heard uh, from 
uh, the invited panelists. Uh, I would actually like to hear from the audience. Uh, what are your suggestions? Uh, how can we make Freedom Online Coalition stronger, better? How we can better involve different voices? And then also, what are some of the key issues that you think Freedom Online Coalition uh, should focus on? Uh, and I see several hands here, so I will bring the mic. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dennis Bruders. I work at the Scientific Council for Government Policy in the Netherlands, and I have a question, uh, I guess, to the whole panel. Um, but I was struck by, um, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name, Andrew, what you said about uh, Freedom Coalition uh, being uh, sort of an exclusively uh, human rights perspective, and that's a big part of its value, while at the same time you noted that at the conference you were in Delhi, you said, okay, we have very different stakeholders within government which have very different perspectives and have very different outlooks on them. So I was wondering how you balance those two because I was sort of saying how would Freedom Online Coalition relate to its, uh, to its own other stakeholders within government? How do you interact with that? How do you uh, prevent this from being an isolated uh, issue? Especially when security has so much wind under its wings right now. Thank you, and I'll collect a couple of other questions and then we can turn to uh, the panel. Uh, thank you so much for such an informative session. And uh, uh, My name is uh, Abir Najjar and I'm uh, with Freedom House. I'm an academic and researcher and I was uh, very happy to listen to your insightful comments about the role of, of Freedom Coalition. And I would like to ask you a question actually building on, on my colleague's comment earlier about what is the outreach sort of uh, project that you have, if you have any, regarding governments, for example, in MENA region. I know that Tunisia is here, and I'm very happy that Tunisia is taking uh, a leading role there. But taking the, exclusivi uh, the exclusivity of the club and on the one hand, and allow me to say that, what is the outreach activity you're doing? And because one of the most important problems with the forum, I find it, and I, I, I was happy to meet many of you in other occasions, is that the fact there is very little involvement from the side of the government in the Arab countries. So I would like to hear more about what's it that we're doing to involve like higher rank sort of governmental people, at least if they don't commit themselves to anything, if they, at least they would listen and they would be exposed to that sort of multi-stakeholder perspective from different points of view. Hi everyone, my name is Beryl Aidi, I'm from the Kenya Human Rights Commission, uh, which is a civil society organization. Um, I was involved um, in the organization partly of the, the, the conference that was held in Kenya in, uh, I think it was in 2012, that was last year, and um, um, there was that, that was through the invitation from the government, but since then I've never heard anything else. So my question is, um, um, in addition to outreach to other governments, um, how, what else can we learn from maybe other countries, how they have engaged their civil society in, within this um, uh, coalition? Thank you. Okay, I will uh, let our participants up front uh, take some of those questions. There's only one mic, so... Uh, <laughs> um, so okay, I'll start. So I'm, I'm Catherine from the U.S. State Department, and I guess this is the first question um, about sort of cohesion within government, within government policy. Um, I think this is, that is an area where the coalition has been helpful internally, speaking from sort of that diplomatic perspective, and that particularly around internet governance issues, around the wicked when we had meetings colleagues from not just the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but Ministries of Communication, economic, economic focused colleagues having meetings along WTPS and a couple of other forums that until recently weren't recognized as having similar implications necessarily. Um, so that's one area where we've seen its value and there's a long 
there's a lot more there on other cross-cutting issues. I do agree. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think internet governance has been a, a good area where we've seen the value of complaint and use it as a way to educate within government, and there are a lot of other areas that we need to do. comment about the Arab involvement in Arab countries. So we had sent invitation to all Arab countries. It was really tough because we, we didn't have a lot of time to convince, you know, to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of ICT in comparison to my country to send all the letters to the other Arab countries. We had some participation, high level participation from Iraq, we had a good participation from Libya, we had uh, I remember that a lot of Arab countries came Jordan, for example, who participated with his ambassador. So the ambassador of Jordan in Tunisia was in the high level meeting and was during the conference uh, many times participating. Uh, also, I remember Morocco, there, I remember a lot of countries participated with their officials. Some of the countries were in the conference but didn't want to show up their hands. They just say uh, observing. And they didn't want to, to declare their badges as coming from a country or representing a country or something like that. So I, there is a lot of Arab countries coming, and we recognize them because we know that they are looking for the embassy or something, but they are not registered as a government representative. I think this is very important. This is at least the first conference we held about freedom online, special, uh, and, and about all the issues of freedom of human rights on, on, online in the region. It may be the, the first step. I, I'm sure that there is a lot of things that could be done now. Maybe Tunisia will be we will be happy to, to help also and to, to educate. You know, we participated to the Arab IGF recently in, in Algeria. And I was in a panel and we talked very openly to Sudan, to Yemen, to different countries who were in the same panel talking on, on also on the issues related to human rights. And it was also a good opportunity. And that's because we are in a freedom of life coalition, that means that we are involved and committed to talk about those issues, wherever we, we are in the IGF, in the Arab IGF, in different conferences and different things. I'd like to Mike. <laughs> I would mean, I mean just use this opportunity to say that uh, we are not only inviting the Italian, the foreign ministers of Freedom One and Coalition, we are going to invite many others. So uh, probably many of your, your country's ministers will receive the invitation. And also there will be a website which will be freedomonline.ee. So it will be... Uh, from the end of November, most probably, and you will get all the information from there and also registration form. But um, just the last thing what I can quickly add that uh, my minister and my, our president uh, is traveling around the world having bilateral meetings. They always talk about freedom on my coalition and the codes of that and always, always engaging with all the other governments. I would just like to uh, answer the third uh, question of, uh, of Kenya. What kind of outreach is being done within countries uh, of the coalition? And I think it even uh, addresses also the first question, uh, how do you strike a balance um, uh, between the different interests, let's say, that countries have uh, uh, concerning uh, uh, freedom online, striking a balance between security issues and freedom issues. Uh, as coalition, we have uh, uh, asked uh, all, all the members to also set up national meetings um, and uh, to discuss uh, also with other uh, ministries and departments, but also with other stakeholders within their countries, uh, uh, freedom online issues from this uh, human rights perspective. But um, I think we, um, uh, being honest, I mean, we see different um, levels, let's say, of participation from the different member countries, and it's def definitely something that we also uh, are aware of and that we are also trying to, uh, to cope with. But um, um, in, in, in this respect, we're also looking at structuring uh, the coalition more. We're uh, thinking of setting up a support unit, and we really hope, you know, that that will also help in uh, providing more content, for example, for the members themselves, and, and following up uh, on some of the initiatives uh, that we want to take. And Andrew, you want to do that? I think I just should pick up from a civil society point of view on, on your point about the consistency of government and obviously in relation to the security and human rights field it's kind of a massive issue now and I'm sure a lot of people are thinking well what, what does it mean when you have governments who are committed to you know, 
to Freedom Online to where there's serious questions or discussions or debates about security. I mean, I think we're, I mean, we could take a different view. My view is that there is a, currently a very, very raging debate about the appropriate balance between human rights, security, privacy, freedom of expression, brought about by the kind of the Snowden revelation. And that debate's raging between government and people, between media and government, between people in civil society and inside government. I mean, there are a set of layers to this. There are legislative moves, there are legal moves in many countries to try and rationalise this. So, or not rationalise it, but settle where that balance lies. Um, my view is that engaging in something like the coalition is a way of promoting stronger human rights arguments and pushing the debate more towards the human rights side of the balance, away from the pure state security surveillance side. And that's something, and that, if we do that successfully, not only do we strengthen the arguments we're coming from civil society, we should strengthen the arguments that we're having with business, and we can strengthen the hand of those inside government who are also arguing from a human rights point of view with their own security apparatus, because these debates are going on, as we all know, inside government as well. So I think the coalition for me is not so much a place where you expect countries to behave a certain way, because countries always have inconsistent positions. It's a forum for engagement with the issues to promote a consistent human rights approach amongst a group of like-minded allies who, who seek to promote that human rights approach. So I see the coalition as an opportunity in the current climate to actually promote and further the arguments for a human rights approach to human security. That's I just want to briefly uh, echo a lot of what Andrew just said. I mean, there's a tremendous framing difference that happens when you start a conversation about these issues from the perspective of a freedom meeting, right? I mean, rhetorically, the, the value and the impact of that should not be understated, and I very much agree with that. I wanted to talk a little bit uh, in response to outreach. As, as someone who's been involved with and helps have organized many coalitions over the past year, uh, there's, a, there's a tension point, right? And outreach to include a broad diversity of foreign ministers uh, and, and substantive expertise is an event like the Estonian Coalition is wonderful, but don't lose that great core that the FOC has now of a set of countries that can really engage uh, and agree on a lot of different things. And this goes back to my point earlier about the, the amazing impact that a really concrete set of principles and recommendations for policy will have when it's generated by this group, right? And if we, if we lose that core, we'll get to the point where the only thing that the FOC can really say is internet equals good, and then we've lost the value that this group has. Thank you very much. So I would like to turn it back to the audience. And does anyone have any specific recommendations, for example, in terms of how you would like to see your own stakeholder group uh, get involved with Freedom Online Coalition? Uh, what do you think would be the most constructive way of engaging? Hi, I'm Zara Dean from Pakistan, and I work with a Developing Countries Center for Cybercrime. Uh, in terms of recommendations, there are two issues that I would like to raise. Uh, the first being on best practices for the surveillance in the criminal justice system, because these procedures don't exist in place in many developing countries. So I would like to hear what your suggestions are or what we can do along those lines. The second issue I would like to raise is what are Freedom Online Coalition or intergovernmental mechanisms that we can employ to put pressure on companies that would provide technology in areas or countries where these mechanisms are being used to curb human rights. Uh, for instance, the employment of net sweeper in Pakistan. Right, I'll take one more comment before I return back to the panel. Uh, I'm Artem uh, Garena from Kyrgyzstan, uh, organization to initiate economic human policy in the house of education. Uh, so uh, this uh, question I would like to ask is what I discussed many times. It's like uh, balance between human rights and security. I mean, uh, Kyrgyzstan, because of uh, strong ethnic clashes several years ago, uh, experienced many problems in uh, 
the things like hate speech, like uh, religious extremism, and just I really uh, would like to uh, promote uh, joining Kurdistan uh, Freedom Online Coalition, but I definitely need uh, very good arguments to convince government for that because you know uh, many high level officials and security services especially uh, will be really against this decision because uh, you know some of them are very straight thinking guys and uh, the only way they see is just to restrict using internet, restrict uh, access to sites and so so, so I would like to share some maybe some suggestions from you for that. Thank you. All right, so we have several questions here. One being, how do you uh, make the countries commit and belong to Freedom Online Coalition? In other words, how do you recruit new members and then make them adhere to the principles set forth? And then another one is, how can uh, Freedom Online Coalition and the countries that belong to it can be utilized as a resource to, uh, to showcase the best practices for countries that are currently looking for uh, the ways to regulate uh, the internet. So I will turn the mic back to you. Well, I, I just wanted to uh, usurp the moderator as well for a minute and, and report a tweet, <laughs> which is from Dalia Ajomar. This person says, the Freedom Online Coalition, not all member states are engaging at the same level. A support unit might allow a spectrum of follow-up. I was just going to make a comment about how to engage in this coalition. It was just, uh, just comment. Yeah. Uh, it was something that we, we are committed to, because after the revolution, you know, we will, there, there is a decision made at the, at the high level. Of course, ITI help us a lot in this decision. We advocate with inside the government and within the Ministry of ICT to, to forget about censorship and so on and to move forward to the human rights of life. So we did it in a way that we, uh, we, we were invited to the Kenyan conference at that time and we proposed to the government at that time to say, okay, if you want to highlight your commitment to the society, it's, it's a moment to do that. And, and they accepted at that time. And, uh, I think this is really, really worthy for didn't make it like this. It was coming from from the society and through ITI we went to the government. And so it is. Uh, each country has its context and has its own way to do things. And uh, I think uh, this has to be uh, started from the society and from the community, from activists that can have access to some body or some uh, maybe the operators that, like we discussed last uh, uh, in the last panel, say. Maybe the operators and the ISPs could play an important role because they want to commit to, the, to their customers and to show that there's a, bit, a very good will to work with, them, with the society about human rights and online. It depends on the for, for us, ITI did it. So maybe in the other country it would be different. Yeah, I, can, I can just say a few words um, to the question from, from our colleague from Hungarian. Uh, that you can you can start like uh, convincing your government to become uh, pro um, how to say pro internet issues in a big organization like um, uh, like the Human Rights Council for example in third committee in UNGA uh, also all 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 that because in, in the Human Rights Council the internet resolution was adopted all the governments uh, were not really in favor of that. Even it was adopted uh, by consensus finally, and everybody was very glad. But, but still, all the governments were not really working for for the consensus adoption and all that. So to, to convince the government to become a member of the Freedom Online Coalition, uh, it's, it's also to start convincing government to, to become pro proactive and uh, positive towards all the internet uh, and human rights issues in the internet in, in all the other organizations. And also to try to um, come up in, the, for example, like simple things like uh, freedom house uh, tables, like uh, press freedom, freedom internet tables. If the government are coming, really, there's an increase. Of course, uh, it, it will be easier.
Yeah, maybe just concerning uh, uh, the issue of how, how, how can the FSC be a resource for best practices. I think this is really something that uh, uh, we're also looking into currently. Um, it's, it's a bit of a difficult issue, you know. We, amongst ourselves, we share uh, the best practices we see. For example, uh, uh, Sweden, uh, uh, Carl Bildt has just uh, uh, made a speech in, in, in Seoul where he says, you know, the, the principles of necessity and, and proportionality, this is the way we interpret them for Sweden. I think that's really, you know, uh, a best practice. But um, um, uh, we're going to set up a website, you know. I think surely there, there, there will be room, you know, to share best practices. But also, uh, during the conferences, I think that is, a, that is an important uh, way to talk to each other and, and, and just find out, you know, which, yeah, which practices uh, are working. But also here, I mean, if you have ideas here on, on, on the way we should pick, you know, pick, pick up on that, uh, that would be very welcome. comment briefly about the, the NetSuite for Pakistan thing. I, 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 my perspective on this is that this is a sh dealing with uh, incidents of abuse of information technology like this is a shared responsibility among all of us in the room to engage in the ways that are appropriate. So I wanted to flag uh, Zillow's engagement on this not that long ago um, when there was Fisher software being used against Bahraini activists. Mozilla filed a trademark lawsuit because the software was mimicking uh, Firefox in a certain way that was causing people to believe that it was being operated on the computer when in fact it was spyware. Freedom House has engaged on this repeatedly in the past. They have a very nice map of, uh, of uh, surveillance equipment exported by the West into the Middle East um, with some really nice naming and shaming activities going on there. Uh, and the governments have the role to play as well, both through sort of bilateral engagements with other governments that, that each of the individual governments can do, through the occasional FOC getting together and, and publicly rebuking uh, specific practices, but that's just something that we all can, will, should, and are helping with. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I will turn it back to the audience, and I know that we have uh, several questions, and I would also really like to encourage the audience, in addition to asking very valuable questions, if you have some constructive feedback, both in terms of engagement, but, both in tr but also in terms of the topic that should be taken up by Freedom Online Coalition, uh, please free feel free to comment. Um, I think the representative from Estonia made a very good point about the scope, which sort of, I'm oh, sorry, Mike Harris from Index and Country. Um, what I would like to ask is, some of the member states of the Freedom Online Coalition uh, I'm going to name two, US, UK, Prison, Tempora. There are clearly issues around their commitment to privacy and freedom of expression. One of the strengths of the Freedom Online Coalition is generally the member states have, on the whole, a reputable, uh, respectable record on online freedom. Can you name states that you wouldn't allow into the Freedom Online Coalition? Where are, the, the, where are the boundaries to this coalition? And can you see a point at which you would say down the line, maybe not now, but down the line, sorry, you've broken uh, your commitments to freedom of expression, you've broken your commitments to fundamental human rights, you can no longer be members of the Freedom Online Coalition. Thank you. And I saw several hands here. Thank you, uh, Artie Tsuya Mungun from Thai Medicine Network based in Bangkok. Uh, speaking of like maybe like new issue or topics that like, should be concerned as well, uh, just like uh, make an example, just uh, recently as well, but uh, also actually going on for like several years. So when when like uh, some some of the, of the countries like uh, make a, a questions to like Thai government during the UPR process uh, about like the, the freedom online and uh, cases that related to to that. Uh, one one of the like I don't know, say reason or, or excuse or whatever rationale that like Thai government say as, as also like a lot of governments are trying to make is that uh, they 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 referring to like cult uh, cultural sensitivity that okay this this is this is a thing that like belongs uh, to, to our cultures our norms and uh, 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 you know so uh, human rights should like respect uh, the local culture as well 
So, so when 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 it comes to 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 this kind of like a cultural sensitivity kind of thing, which like many, many countries have like their own religious right, their own culture, like how 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 this coalition going to to deal with that, and like in, uh. Starting from that point, uh, I, I will give a like, very con concrete uh, example uh, that uh, going to be uh, passed as a law in Thailand very soon. Uh, the, the cabinet just uh, approved this uh, new bill called uh, Intangible Cultural Heritage Bill, which they actually referring to to the UNESCO uh, program uh, about like okay. Uh, so basically, it's, it's kind of uh, the preservation of the intangible uh, cultural forms, cultural heritage, and I mean, in a sense, it's actually a very good one, like, like to pro it's kind of like protection of the minority uh, minority rights, right? Or those like cultural form mi minority groups that many times has been taken and they used by a large corporation or been uh, exploited by some government. Things like that. So in a sense, it's actually a, a, a very good program. But in the end, uh, inside this law, it's actually a criminalization of like any kind of expression that consider insulting uh, some kind of cultural forms, whether it's going to be offline or online. So I don't know like how how, how this coalition also like uh, uh, a lot of countries uh, in in this coalition also do a grant ma making uh, grant making programs to various kind of uh, uh, programs that like support uh, uh, minority rights, uh, support like local cultures, and UNESCO is play. play Play a big part in this intangible uh, cultural heritage program. So, like, I mean, how 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 you this coalition going to deal with this kind of like cultural sensitivity or stuff? Thanks. Uh, hi, it's Brett Solomon from Access. Um, I, I have been a um, supporter of the Freedom Online Coalition for some time. Um, certainly, many civil society organisations have. Uh, but I do think it's important that we be honest about. Um, the Snowden revelations and the impact on the Freedom Online Coalition's moral authority to be able to negotiate in these spaces. Um, and, you know, I think many of us were in the room yesterday when the Chinese delegates stood up and said, listen, like, if you're going to be out there proselytizing, you need to clean up your own houses first. Um, and, and I say that because we actually need you as human society. Like, we actually need body of government that are able to stand up with that kind of moral authority and with a clean house to go explain uh, and put forward the best practices nationally. Um, so I have a couple of suggestions. Um, one is I think that it would be good if there were national contact points for each part uh, of the country members. And I think there also needs to be some kind of complaint mechanism so that members of civil society within the member countries are able to actually raise the issues of what's happening domestically and also internationally. And then the second um, uh, suggestion relates to the necessary proportion of principles which Carl Bill um, referred to in his speech, quoted in his speech, uh, in Seoul. And I think there is a real opportunity for the member countries to look at those principles very clearly and determine or audit their own existing laws and their proposed legislation to see how they meet the standards contained uh, in that document. Thank you. I'm Eduardo Bertoni, I'm a law professor in Argentina, Palermo University School of Law. Um, I, I also would like to make a suggestion and endorse what Brett has said in terms of civil societies need these kind of coalitions, we need countries that we can talk about these issues, so uh, I support the, the coalition. But I would suggest that, eh, and following what our colleagues from the censorship said, maybe it's time to think some sort of, you know, point of entrance of, <laughs> to, to, to the coalition. As far as I, I, I understand, and maybe I'm wrong, you can correct me, any country that just signed the statement could be part of the coalition. It's may, maybe some, it's not that the case, or maybe my proposal is not going to be useful. But because I, 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 I my, my, my suggestion was to look what's going on in other kind of coalitions like this. For example, the recent created Open Government Partners. The Open Government Partners Partnership is led by Brazil and the United States. To enter to the to that group of countries you have to sign something and you have to present formally a plan of action. 
on how you are going to you know fulfill that the principles of, of, of the coalition so maybe this is an idea try to see how other country coalitions are doing and try to you know formalize in some way which countries can be part of the coalition and I totally endorse what Fred said to have some sort of complaint mechanism within the, the coalition. So. Thank you. We're going to take two more comments uh, from the floor before we turn back to the panel. Thank you. Uh, my name is Arzu. I come from Azerbaijan. I'm here with the Freedom House delegation. Uh, mine is more of a recommendation for the meeting. Um, as you know, in Azerbaijan, there is little or no dialogue between the human rights advocates or uh, people who fight for freedom of expression online with the government. So if it is possible to have more smaller discussions with the government representatives and human rights advocates and civil society people, of course, having internationals present in the room so that they can actually hear, probably for the first time, they might claim uh, some of the issues that people face in the country. And maybe after that, develop some kind of responsible mechanism that will hold them responsible, that will hold governments responsible to comply uh, with either the promises that they make during those meetings or uh, issues that are raised and how they deal with it. Hi, my name is Vanessa and I uh, represent a group called Wolubi, Policy of Refugees out of Pakistan. And I raised this question earlier yesterday, but it's a larger group, so I'd like to talk about it again. Um, both the Canadian government and the UK government are part of the Freedom Online Coalition. And in Pakistan, after the Citizen Lab report, we uh, found out that both Finn Fisher and NetSweeper um, are currently functioning in Pakistan. And followed up, follow up to that, we wrote to both the Canadian High Commissioner and the UK High Commissioner in Pakistan. Uh, reaffirming, reminding them of their commitment and reminding them of the fact that they are part of the Freedom Online Coalition uh, and, and, and the usual sort of quoting of the UN uh, principles of business and human rights. But both uh, high commissioners responded, uh, the UK before the, the Canadian. Uh, the UK letter is much stronger than the Canadian letter, but both of them uh, completely overlooked the fact that there are uh, that Freedom Online Coalition is in fact a coalition that they're involved in and it is a freedom of our body. Um, and it was interesting that the Canadian government pointed us to GNI to hold the company responsible, and uh, the UK uh, High Commission responded us to the OECD mechanism. So my suggestion, one and, and a question, would be the question first is: if the countries themselves are not taking this framework seriously and are telling citizens to then rely on other mechanisms like the OECD or the GNI, then how is this going to move forward? And secondly, echoing from what Arzu said, could there be smaller groups and smaller discussions um, among these countries to remind them of their commitment to uh, freedom of expression? Because uh, as I see it, and from where I come from, being cynical, uh, this could very easily be used just as a network for some countries to say, oh, look, I have a token, um, you know, for the token commitment for freedom of expression, when they're not actually doing anything to stop uh, surveillance and to stop being complacent in, uh, in, in such a place. Okay, we'll turn the discussion back to the panel. Okay, thank, thank you. And uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, different points raised. I would like to first uh, uh, say something about the way we evaluate um, uh, uh, countries that would like to become a member. Um, the way we went um, uh, about uh, starting a coalition and also uh, since uh, uh, several new members uh, uh, were, uh, uh, became part of the coalition, we evaluate the record the country has uh, in terms of freedom of expression. Uh, well, we use your report, uh, for example, we use uh, several, several other reports, and we make a, a kind of evaluation also on uh, how this country uh, has done in, in, in its human rights policy. So uh, what, uh, what, what is it doing in the Human Rights Council, what has it been doing in the third committee. So this analysis uh, uh, forms the basis for a decision-making process uh, uh, amongst uh, uh, the coalition members uh, uh, on whether we would uh, like that country to, uh, to become a member again. And then of course, and we've also discussed this already before, uh, uh, 
the impact on the, on, on the moral authority of the coalition uh, of, of the Snowden affair. I think um, uh, there is, you know, of course that is an issue. It is also an issue that we are discussing within the coalition. It is, of course, you know, we are discussing how to um, uh, how to deal with those kinds of uh, things. And I think, you know, we have to be very honest about it. I mean, uh, no one, uh, all, all con no, no country is perfect. And um, I think still, you know, we want as a coalition, uh, we want to um, uh, be also honest about that. And I think, you know, there's many countries that have their issues, and uh, the coalition is also there to engage each other. Uh, on, uh, um, on, on on seeing how to how to also change policy, uh, so I think, and it's and, and it's quite a difficult issue. I mean, I agree. Um, uh, on the other hand, I, I don't think we have to be very naive. I mean, of course, you know, there's also many other countries out there with a lot of issues, and and they will not become a, a part of, of the Freedom Online Coalition. Talking about the mechanisms that you mentioned, I think it's very important. I mean, the OECD mechanism and and GNI maybe even. I mean, this is a coalition uh, of, of the willing, let's say, of the willing countries. It's not institutionalized yet. Uh, so uh, maybe that's also about, you know, what do we expect from it? Uh, sometimes I get the feeling that the expectations uh, are, are, uh, are running really high now. Um, uh, I think it's very good to also look at the mechanisms that are already in place uh, that, you know, that, that can help you uh, uh, in different countries um, uh, to get your governments uh, uh, focus, uh, focus on those kind of mechanisms. And on the other hand, I mean, a lot of principles and ideas are developing, and I think definitely as a coalition we have to look into uh, in, in, into the possibilities uh, uh, they are giving us, and and also see if we can take position there. Freedom Online Tunis, we had very good debate about these issues, and it was very important to see how government reacted to the this question. I was in one of panels and I remember very well a lot of questions coming from activists and from my friends, for sure, but at the same time they are dealing with something that's very important. And this is how it is important to keep the debate between the coalition. And that's why the statement is coming from the civil society during the video online is important. We will be concerned. We all of all of us are concerned. It's not being just being a member of March. We are all concerned the debate becomes even uh, moving on and we, we will be, I think, the future will be right. Yeah. I think it's kind of a couple different points. One is building on what I think it was, which is that I think there, there are two possible reactions in response to questioning the ability of the individual participation in the um, One is to throw in the towel and say, as a mechanism for the and the other is to use it to hold the government to account. And that's what we call it in GMS and the extensive number of letters, um, which have a continuing important discussion. So I think there's a power to having government be publicly on the record and holding a set of public um, And what we're seeing is now that happening in the world of truth. Um, I think uh, as so Chris alluded to forming other coalitions. I think many of you in the group have been in similar positions where you don't have all the answers from the beginning and all the perfect mechanisms in place. And we, on our side, had interesting conversations with colleagues who work on the GC about both some of both things they have in place now and some of the lessons they've learned in the last couple of years. Um, one of the areas of the coalition that I know we've been weekly data and talked about a lot is public communication and having some and information out there. And that's a priority for the next coming months um, to establish that and make it easier to engage. Oh, I'll make one more point. Sorry. On, on sort of the, the coalition as, as a forum on about OECD and GNI, I think from the beginning we've thought of them not as the coalition, not as a forum to solve each problem, but as a contact group to figure out how to handle these issues as they arise in different contexts, whether it's a multilateral forum or whether it's uh, another issue that may be better referred to in the same body. So um, it's interesting to hear that feedback from people. I just wanted to clarify that it's also a, a routing option.
All right, uh, so we don't have too much time left. We have 13 more minutes. So what I would like to uh, do right now is completely focus on the next coalition meeting in Estonia. And uh, as uh, a couple of people previously identified, there's going to be three themes or three themes that were previously identified for students. One being free and secure internet, the second being digital development and openness, and the third being privacy and transparency. Uh, specifically, what would this group suggest that the meeting focuses on? What are some of the things that you, th you think really need to be talked about, used about, uh, that, uh, that would really help further the dialogue when it comes to internet freedom? A couple of things that were already identified uh, were, for example, the issue of surveillance, and obviously that's in everyone's mind. But what else? My God, and I want to just talk briefly today about uh, the principles that apply to the surveillance issue, I think, apply to the as well. And that's, uh, you know, one of the things I, I, I kind of, I, I, wince, I wince when I hear, you know, no government is perfect, except for that it's true, but it's not as strong as it is there. But I think it is true that uh, uh, every government, uh, at least every government, as far as I know, at least reverse, right, reverse itself to right to engage. Online coalition work to espouse principles uh, opposed to surveillance or opposed to this, you know, no one would believe you. Uh, so, so, so I think that, but there are principles that uh, I think apply certainly to surveillance, but maybe apply in other contexts as well. That I think uh, going forward, you can very strongly articulate and maybe have uh, some consensus about. And I'm just writing some notes to myself, and I've Transparency is clearly one of them. Accountability, uh, uh, you know, make people responsible not, you know, both for the stuff that they do lawfully and the stuff that they do unlawfully. Minimization, this is actually really huge in the digital age because uh, governments are now technically more capable of gathering so much more information and of engaging in so much more content control in the digital world than they ever were uh, in the history, in the entire history of, of, of governments. Uh, and, and due process, I think that uh, one of the things that citizens want, you know, citizens need to be realistic about government. Every, everybody knows that governments are going to uh, try to serve their prerogatives to surveil or to censor or to do something else. But uh, due process, structure of ways to invoke your rights as against the government interests, are, are, these are principles that I think uh, governments are members of Evolution can espouse going forward. Clear ways and also use this criteria. Thank you. Uh, specific recommendations uh, for the Talent Conference. Governments are doing things uh, in an incoherent manner. So I would suggest that uh, at the delegation, or maybe before the delegation, there should be some mechanism of having um, not just a multi-stakeholder, but also multi-sectoral um, involvement and engagement with government. Uh, uh, for example, in a lot of these discussions we have, uh, we see mostly um, uh, staff from the uh, ICT department, but, uh, or communications department, but we never see people from the human rights department. So I would be interested to see um, the um, national human rights institution for them. Thank you. Yeah, I'm from, that, from, that, from Vietnam, I'm part of the Korean uh, organization. I don't have any comments on the uh, kids of the next conference. I would like to have a uh, comment on the members of the form. Uh, very much hope to see more dialogue between not only of the members, national and with the other members.
right. Uh, had a couple of hands here. Um, I'm Did I actually see a hand there? Do we have uh, a comment uh, through remote participation? No. Uh, okay, so uh, since we have limited time, I will get only hands from people who actually have specific recommendations for the next conference. So I will first go to Miguel and then to you. My name is Miguel, I'm from Pakistan and I'm here with Real Health Television. Um, it's, um, I'm glad to see that a lot of gender and internet uh, discussion is taking place in IGF and I would like to see this uh, uh, discussion uh, in the next Freedom Online Commission and to get the voices from the developing countries around uh, gender and digital divide. So it would be great to have you know, discussion around this issue as well. Thank you. My comment is also about participation where the internet governments for still don't do remote participation right. Um, a lot of people that are in this forum probably won't be in time. How do we make a positive effort to really engage all people in the developing countries who you know, have global power? How do we get them in the room as well? So it's not just a conversation amongst participants who need to be in Thank you. That was a very constructive comment because I've seen for a number of IGFs actually remote participation being consistently an issue, so I will echo that suggestion. Uh, any other comments from the field, uh, from the floor? So in that case, uh, I would like to turn it back to the panel and uh, if you have any uh, concluding comments uh, and uh, any last words that you would like to speak to us today. I'm going to segue this a little bit by, by making my final thought a uh, constructive suggestion I hope for the next Supreme Online Coalition Conference, which is to include something at the beginning that helps raise the level of technological understanding about these mechanisms. So one of the things that I've worked on a couple of times to speak is that there's there's both a, a technical and a policy difference between targeted surveillance and mass surveillance, and that's something that I think is recognized. But it plays out a lot in how we think about sexual surveillance. But it's something that is going to be missed by a lot of the conversation unless an early part of it is some form of attempt to raise technological understanding of the conversation. I don't know what it's going to take, um, but I still continue to see a large gap in understanding of the internet and how it works uh, and how some things can take place in efforts to address that. Um, I think there are a lot of great suggestions which I'm sure everyone can reflect on. The one comment I want to come back to is Mike's about remote participation. I think the great thing, one of the exciting things for me about the meeting being held in Estonia is that, as I'm sure many of you know, this is one of the most sophisticated and developed and advanced online countries in the world. It dwarfs pretty much most people on the planet. So what I'm hoping they can do is show us how a conference can be run in the 21st century that actually uses the technology to, to, to strengthen that broader engagement beyond the physical participation. Because I think if anybody can do it, the Estonians can do it. So 
I know that's a slightly <coughs> no pressure, but you do have some amazing capacities there that I think would be good, A, to showcase, to show how things can develop, but also, I mean, if you could think and, and work with all of us on looking at broader engagement in the course of the conference, it could set a model for things like the IGF and the wider I think I'm also talking about Colin and one thing uh, we're considering is you know, Arthur's point, which is um, how to structure better engagement at the conference among stakeholders, using smaller rounds of getting government, private sector, society, and other discussions. So that's something we've been thinking and talking about since the last time we've done this. Uh, I would also uh, uh, like to thank you for uh, some suggestions like setting up the national contact points. I think that's a very good idea. And maybe also the same mechanism online. And like I said, we are looking at uh, setting up a website and if you that would really help. But also, what I take back um, as a very important suggestion is that for people in my coalition, maybe in non member countries, um, where there are difficult situations, can get together and talk to uh, uh, assist with that government. And I think that is something that we can also work on. And uh, I definitely uh, uh, see added value there. So thank you. I think I would like to thank you all for for the statements and comments and advice on that content. And uh, also, I I want to leave a chance to share the intro. You're not right. Of course, people who are here they cannot come to Tallinn. <laughs> I would I would like to see you in Tallinn. Um, but 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 also I. I, I feel a high pressure from this room. <laughs> Expectations are really high, and, and, uh, and Andrew is not making it easier for us. <laughs> but it's, it's good, so thank you very much. Yeah, uh, just once more the, the dates 28 and 29 April in Tallinn. Not at the moment, but uh, as there is still like half a year time, so we'll see what, what comes up. But, uh, the start at the moment is planified for Monday morning on 28th of April. But there will be a website um, about the conference, so you will get more information there to, to use some search mechanisms. The website. Freedomonline.gn website of Freedomonline conference has been hacked now. It's hacked now. The hackers who use them, who you who use it, they know very well, they develop it. So if you think Website, give you a message, say that you need to actually to have an option to think with a lot of corporations and from the actual code the message. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, two points. The one is uh, to, to just reiterate this point that I think the, the challenge is to get those uh, countries which are not members of the coalition to feel that it's essential they come as observers for the debate for them to know even if they don't agree with the debate. Uh, so the good thing about the Freedom Online Coalition is not exposed uh, to transparency uh, coalition. So I, I think that somehow you have to become indispensable for non-members to come into the uh, and of course uh, work out your terms of participation as well. The, the second point I wanted to say is that this question of balancing uh, rights, um, of course the, the right to privacy versus the right to security and surveillance very big thing, but it was mentioned uh, earlier by a speaker about the, the right to culture and how does that impact on freedom of expression. Well, that's another issue. And I would bring another right into the whole picture, which, which is property rights. Because the, one of the, the things around the surveillance is whether some of the surveillance has been done for commercial reasons rather than security reasons. And so I, I think that it would be a very interesting discussion in Thailand to say the kind of principles that people are elaborating for surveillance. Um, if you approach other rights also, could these principles be applied to other rights? Uh, whether you're talking about property rights or uh, rights to culture or rights to education or rights to human nutrition. So the whole question of standards for what is legitimate surveillance and what is legitimate cult cultural protection, what is legitimate property rights and so on, all in relation to each other. I think this is very important. Thank you very much for a very productive discussion. Before everyone leaves, uh, I was asked uh, to announce that if you're interested to remain engaged, uh, 
please come uh, forward and uh, we will take your name and email address if you're willing to share. And then we can figure out a way how to uh, get everyone uh, involved. Uh, there is a reason why Estonia is often called Estonia and uh, I look forward to going to Tallinn and uh, I look forward to continuing this very productive discussion uh, in April. Thank you very much.